women's health, women's bodies, women's lives. Our week-long celebration began this morning with a health fair that surrounds you, that, and that fair will continue until 4 p.m. this afternoon. In addition to the panel discussion, which begins shortly, we invite you to attend any or all of the following University of Utah Women's Week activities. Body of evidence and exhibit of photographer Deborah Willis Kennedy's work can be viewed around the corner in the Union Gallery. Tomorrow, March 25th, we present a film festival in the Union Theater. Beginning at 11 a.m. and running into the evening, we are showing Cancer in Two Voices, Legacy, On ha Hostile Ground, Real Women Have Curves, The Pill, and Wit. Please join us in this room at 12 noon on Wednesday, March 26th for our keynote lecture given by Dr. Joycelyn Elders, former United States Surgeon General. On Thursday, March 27th, writer and filmmaker Jean Kilborn will present a lecture based on her work examining the use of women and women's bodies in advertising. Her lecture is titled Deadly Persuasion, Advertising and Addiction and will take place at 7 p.m. in the Gould Auditorium of the Marriott Library. We conclude our celebration on Friday, March 28th at 7 p.m. with a free concert featuring singer Jill Sobuel at Kingsbury Hall. Although the event is free, tickets are required and available at the Kingsbury Hall ticket office or the union desk. We hope that you will attend and participate in as many of these events as your schedules permit. As the celebration committee planned for this week, it became clear that the theme we selected this year, women's health, women's bodies, women's lives, necessitated a health fair. We are grateful to the University of Utah student chapter of the American Medical Women's Association who are responsible for organizing today's fair. Finally, thanks are extended to Christy Rugen, Director of Grants and Scholarship Programs in the Office of Diversity and a member of the Women's Week Celebration Committee for putting this afternoon's panel together. It is my honor to introduce today's panel moderator, Sunny Nakai Gibson, who is a program coordinator in the School of Medicine's Office of Diversity and Community Outreach. Most recently, Sunny was accepted into the University of Utah's Graduate School of Social Work. We are going to begin our panel today. The ins and outs of women's sexual health is the title. Every minute somewhere in the world, two women are infected with HIV. Every two minutes, a woman dies of AIDS. More than 240 Utah women have been diagnosed with HIV and AIDS. Worldwide, women represent an increasingly larger percentage of adults, defined as 15 years and older, who are infected with HIV. Infection rates for women have climbed from 41% in 1997 to 47% in 2000 and continue to rise. Half a million infections are in children under the age of 15, most of which have been transmitted from mother to child. It is because of these daunting figures concerning women in HIV and AIDS that we have assembled this panel of experts this afternoon to discuss and answer your questions about HIV, AIDS, STIs, and the ins and outs of women's sexual health. Our panelists are um, Clayton Vetter. Clayton has been with Planned Parenthood and, and the Planned Parenthood Association of Utah for over four years. He's currently the education director. He also teaches human sexuality here at the University of Utah. And prior to that, he taught public school for 13 years. Um, next, we have Jenny Van Horn. She went to college at Amherst and medical school at the University of Washington. She's currently an assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, as well as medical director of Planned Parenthood Association of Utah. And we'd like to thank these guys for being here. Next, we have Betty Sawyer. She's a graduate of Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland, and the University of Utah with degrees in physical education and physical therapy, and a candidate for her master's in public administration. She is past director of the Governor's Office of Black Affairs, where she served for 10 years to address public policy issues affecting African Americans and other people of color. She's the director of Project Success Coalition Community Learning Center, which includes the Northern Utah HIV AIDS Project, providing prevention education and harm reduction outreach throughout Ogden and Weber County. And next we have Trisha Bishop. She's a community health education degree from University of Wisconsin-La Crosse and worked at the HIV and AIDS Resource Center in Wisconsin for two years. 
Um, she came to Utah with the American Red Cross um, as the Youth HIV and AIDS Education Coordinator. And she is now a health educator with University of Utah Health Service. And um, Trisha does have to leave early, so we'll excuse her at that time. Um, last we have Vicki Judd. She did her undergraduate at the University of Utah and went on to medical school here. Um, she went to do her residency at Baylor in Texas and is a pediatric cardiologist here at Primary Children's Hospital now. She also served as the Dean of Admissions for the School of Medicine and is now the Medical Director of Student Health. Um, I have a few questions that I'm going to be posing and we'll ask the panelists to jump in and answer if they feel that they um, have a good answer for the question. And I'm going to sit at the table. And panelists, if I could ask you to pull the microphone close to you when you answer questions, that would be great. Um, why has HIV and AIDS prevention historically focused on males? <laughs> I would just say initially, you know, looking at the epidemic, it um, did primarily um, occur in males. So that's, um, you know, where the initial emphasis was. But now the nature of um, HIV is really changing and it's becoming much more, you know, of um, an issue for women at this stage. So there needs to be much more focus on screening women and um, encouraging that. I think another um, aspect of that is also those who do research tend to involve populations that are like the researcher. And we've seen that with a number of diseases, not just HIV. Um, and it's been the, only in the past decade that researchers have been more inclusive of individuals who are not like them. So not only women, but people of color and other populations, children and other groups, have not been traditionally included in research of all types. And so that also adds to the problem. Next question, how do the biases and moral expectations toward women in our society translate into substandard care in healthcare and disease prevention for women? I would say that with women of color, there's an extra stigma when attached to issues around HIV and AIDS. Uh, one is that caregiver is the one who doesn't question authority, doesn't question our men. We're just to be there regardless and do what we're supposed to do with a smile. So along with that, if we were to speak up, if we were to challenge and try to negotiate issues around our sexuality, our whole moral fiber would be challenged. Why do you need to know? Why do you ask? Are you doing something you shouldn't do? And those are ongoing issues within our community. I think just like Vicki had stated before um, about research and the researchers doing the research on similar populations, um, specifically to HIV, the medications um, are mainly tested on men. Um, so I don't think um, we know enough information about how these medications are affecting women. Okay. The fastest growing demographic of individuals infected with HIV and AIDS is heterosexual women, specifically between ages of 25 and 40. What must be done to curb the climbing infection rate? Start out with a cry. Your sisters are dying. Wake up, everybody. Uh, I think that's the most important thing. We are walking around kind of in a daze. We're, we're a little behind because the focus was so much on men and men having sex with men initially that we are way behind this whole movement to educate ourselves, to be spokespersons for ourselves, and to uh, become aware. And testing is a major issue. No one's still beating down the doors to be tested for the virus. We're just not going. You know, I like to emphasize that, to really encourage women to be screened for HIV. And the one place where we see a huge significance is in pregnant women and really encouraging screening. Um, if women are screened, you can reduce the risk to the fetus by up to 70% with medical care drugs, C-section when indicated. So um, that's a really important step. I think also that women need to take responsibility for their own health, not only in HIV, but every other aspect. And we need to be aware, educated, responsible, um, prevention, testing, um, all aspects of our own health we need to be responsible for. No one else is going to take that responsibility. 
Well, and I want to say love sex. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Um, I think that, you know, it's part of, <clears throat> as a human sexuality instructor and as an educator of Planned Parenthood, the thing I've learned over the last four years is that our culture is, especially with women, instructs women to, you know, not speak as positively about their sexuality, to withhold sexuality. It's like, that's just crap. Love sex. Sex is a wonderful thing. Isn't sex cool? I think sex is very cool. I I'm hoping other people will hear that. They'll start coming in. They'll go, oh my god, they're talking about sex in there. And some guy's up there saying sex, or they won't know who's saying it. So <laughs> sex is really good. Um, part of our stigma around dealing with sexuality uh, related health issues is that people live in denial about their sexuality and their sexual being and they don't celebrate it and they don't love it enough if you love your sexuality you don't want to lose it you want to keep having really good sex you want to have even better sex and I don't want anything to get in the way of that so I want to know if I've got something and I want it to go away um, or to get a little better so I can keep having really good sex I just don't think we have enough positive discussions about sexuality. I think we approach it so negatively and, you know, here's what it looks like and here's how it's going to eat you up and here's what <laughs> it's like, my lord. Um, that's not what people respond to. That just puts them farther back into denial and thinking it will never be them and it will never happen to them. And let's celebrate sexuality more. That's my solution. Woohoo! <laughs> Obviously, as all of these people have set up here, prevention education is the key, but I also think we need to educate our providers as well as this is something important and they need to be asking those important questions to the patients that they are seeing. I think along with that, not to continue on, but to me this is probably the heart of our discussion today uh, with women. Uh, there are a lot of trends that are going on in our communities that we still don't talk about. Uh, when you look at the uh, community of color, African Americans and Latinos in the state of Utah, we still have disproportionately high rates in the penal system. And there's a trend called the down low. A lot of us don't even know what it is, but many of these men are being exposed to sex with men in the penal institutions. They're coming back to us to women and they're in our beds and we're excited to see them and we don't even think about those kinds of things. So we really have to start talking with each other and talking about those issues that for so long have been areas of stigma. To, stigma. I won't even try to go there. Areas of stigma. So uh, we need to continue to be informed, to talk to one another about these things if we don't have anyone else to talk to. Okay. Um, what additional services and considerations do women with HIV and AIDS who are the primary caregivers in their families have or need? Um, I know a lot of drug treatment programs have adjusted their treatment paradigms to include the, the needs of women as caregivers um, and as definitely a factor in their treatment. Um, and what must be done to address those needs? In the state of Utah, they have started looking at areas around uh, case management which is excellent. For a long time that wasn't an issue. You dealt with your primary care provider or went where uh, you could, whether it was in the state of Utah or out of the state, to get treatment and to deal with those issues. Now funds are available in the state where we have advocates that help women address the whole gamut of issues that come up with being infected themselves, whether it's dealing with their emotional needs, their social needs, being able to tell others how they deal with issues at school, uh, the whole myriad of issues around health care and payments and funds for medication. So there are some um, beacons of light in our community to address the woman as a total person. How does the double standard on sexuality, uh, specifically a man who has many partners is, is not looked down upon as much as a woman who has many partners, how does that standard translate into substandard care and lower, level, lower levels of health access for women? <laughs> well, I think it, it's a, what I was saying earlier. I mean, I think it does translate. I think that um, women are expected to have more control and um, understanding of their sexuality, keep it contained. Um, and I think that translates, translates into some interesting health care dilemmas. Um, women account for two-thirds of all health care visits. 
um, yet they are underrepresented in terms of being physicians or doing research or that kind of stuff. And uh, the thing I'm always encouraging women to do is to, to get more involved. We need to have more women who are in the legislature, <laughs> a lot more women. Um, we need more women in the medical profession. We need more women in positions of power. And I always advocate for that. And we need more men um, to stand up as allies to support that. And in terms of sexuality, we just didn't, I, I try to encourage women to be more open and, and positive about their sexuality. Don't you love sex in the city? I do. <laughs> I do. I love those women. I love Kim Cattrall as Samantha. Isn't she the most amazing woman because she says, I love sex. I have sex with lots of men. I love all the men I have sex with. I love her. <laughs> I do, I do. I think that that's, and she's a very healthy person. That's not coming from an unhealthy uh, perspective. She really appreciates her sexuality. And don't you get the feeling Samantha takes good care of her health? Um, I doubt she would ever neglect her health because she sees her body and her being as so central and connected. And, and I like that very much. I think along with the double standard, um, goes to the heart of educating the health care providers. I think there are some healthcare providers who are not aware, um, may be aware but forget to ask that many of their patients may not have what they consider the traditional lifestyle or traditional habits or traditional exposure. And I think a lot of the, the burden of this needs to fall on the healthcare provider, making sure that they're educated, that all patients explore all issues and not just presume because of what they look like or you've seen them before or something about them that you know everything about them that you need to ask and you need to discuss issues and you need to be open and you need to be non-judgmental and you need to provide appropriate care for all individuals. I think not only is it from a double standard from societies but it's also from the health care providers. We need to make sure we are educated so we can provide the best care possible for all patients. I think another step forward is, again, uh, us as women taking responsibilities for our own self and our own health. Oftentimes we are so busy being that caretaker that we continue to put ourselves last. We run to the doctor for everybody and often ourselves last. And so it's important that we take that kind of responsibility. Also the need for advocacy. I don't know if many of you watch the different movements nationally, but when there are parades and gay pride days and things of that nature, there are very few women that are out there on that front line. It's growing, but men have been very active, very vocal. They've been advocating on their behalf. They have been getting with their legislators, their leaders, power brokers, and we can't forget about economics. Economics is a very real issue and powerful issue and this whole issue of HIV and other health issues for women. What are the barriers women face in getting tested and treated for HIV, AIDS, and STIs that men do not face? Economic. Economic. <laughs> for sure. Lack of resources. Just all the things that we've already been talking about, the stereotypes, the fact that if a woman has more than one partner, she's considered promiscuous or slutty or all of those awful words that I'm sure you've all heard. And I would second what Dr. Judd said, that, that health care providers uh, may not be offering it to all women, and they really need to be educated and um, encourage women to be screened. And what is the health insurance policy typically on screening for HIV and AIDS and STI testing? Is it covered by most insurance policies? Just I just recently made a phone call to um, Blue Cross Blue Shield and asked them, and of course they couldn't give me a direct answer on the phone, and I had to go searching through the web page that they gave me, which was not very helpful at all. So um, we encourage people not to put it on their health insurance when they do come into student health to the, the HIV testing. Um, sexually transmitted disease testing um, is something that I believe insurance companies do cover. And our local health departments provide those services for free. Uh, again, we hand out uh, with our program probably a thousand coupons uh, a year. They're available, readily available, but no one wants to use them. We are still not seeing people come in uh, to be tested, and that's a challenge. We're still sticking our head in the sand and pretending it doesn't exist 
or it'll go away. So there are their free testing is definitely available. It's getting people to come in and utilize that uh, resource and a lot of them are doing it for fear that if they find out then their life is going to change and it will change but knowing you then have the power to be a part of uh, what is going to happen versus just allowing things to happen to you and have to uh, react to the situation versus being a partner from the beginning and deciding how your life is going to be. Even when you take the screening to where individuals are, it may not be utilized fully because of um, being uneducated, stigmata, many reasons. So again, it comes down to the same issues we're talking about, taking responsibility for your own health care and then being educated and um, taking advantage of what's available. Um, it's difficult. And I would just like to say, too, an interesting place where you see the stigma is where we screen women at their first OB visit. And we don't even blink or think twice about checking a syphilis test or doing chlamydia or gonorrhea cultures. But, you know, boy, that HIV part of it really stands out there. And it shouldn't. It needs to be, you know, just consider excuse me, considered routine care. And I think physicians need to get more comfortable presenting it that way to their female patients. That, you know, this is just, you know, part of making sure you're healthy and your baby's going to be healthy and get rid of all the stigma that surrounds that. Little plug for Planned Parenthood. Women can come into any Planned Parenthood and get a screen for HIV for other STIs at reduced cost. Um, and that's one of the things we do. Planned Parenthood nationally tested, did uh, over 40,000 HIV tests on women, um, 10,000 on men. So Planned Parenthood is a place that, that tries to fill that economic gap. And we also try to make it a positive experience and we view sexuality more positively. Yeah, I'm getting nervous for myself because I've heard myself say things and I can now, I'm seeing like headlines in the cranny, like of things that I've said. <laughs> so, I, you know, I want to be really clear <laughs> on what I'm saying about sexuality. I don't want anyone to, you know, walk away and think, wow, you know, he's really off the chart. Sexuality is such a holistic issue, but our culture tends to hear the word sex and they automatically think of some type of intercourse that if I'm celebrating sexuality, I'm only thinking of intercourse and that's what our minds kind of leap to. And I see sexuality is so much more than that. It's, it's how you interact with yourself, the, the other genders that you deal with. It's how you look at the world. It's how you express yourself. Sexuality is a very large, large, large issue. So, and I think all of it needs to be more celebrated. Student Health Services on campus also offers it at a, a much lower cost and um, confidential and in a positive light. So. so how about adolescent women that are not 18? What um, provisions are there to, for them to get tested? I mean, working with a lot of the teen population that I've seen um, at the teen home and the YWCA and at, also at the homeless shelter for youth, it's obviously an issue in younger populations. And uh, teens can be tested uh, at the health department without parental consent. And uh, most of our sexuality we know now and the whole issue of HIV and AIDS is uh, being done in our schools. And I had the opportunity on a regular basis to do training with our uh, prevention staff from both of our school districts. And when I look at the teen pregnancy rates in Utah, I'm not surprised. I, I go to the people and they're usually very nervous and I said, hey, I don't know you either. You think I'm not nervous to stand before you and talk about these things, but most of them are still not talking to their children about sexuality. They're not talking, they assume they're not going to do it. But I said, but look at the pregnancy rate in Utah, they're doing it. So please help them. Uh, I've been blessed to have all sons and my sons and beget other sons. So right now I have six young men living in my home and I'm ready to leave. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, it's another opportunity. My husband is still way behind the curve in talking about sexuality. So that leaves me. And so whether I like it or not, I step up and we deal with it. You know, we talk about uh, making a plan, just like anything else. I tell them, you need a plan for staying abstinence, and abstinence is still a choice. It's a choice, so we can't choose that. But if you don't, and like anything else, if you have a plan what you're going to do not to get involved sexually, then nine times out of ten it's going to happen like it does everybody else. In the wrong place, wrong time, things happen. 
So don't be hanging out with just all women. Don't go to folks' house when their parents aren't home. Okay, there are certain things that you will not do. You just don't do it. And then hopefully you'll have better outcomes. And if by chance I've taken them and showed them how to use a condom. I'm a Christian. It's a challenge. But, you know, above all of that, I'm a human being. And I know what happens. It may happen, and I want you to be prepared. There is the uh, homeless team clinic. The co medical co-director of the uh, homeless clinic is Joan Sheets, and she is a adolescent medicine specialist specializing um, in homeless teen problems, and they can be tested there and treated and taken care of, um, similar without parental consent. So, um, are there currently any gender-specific prevention or education programs for women, and if so, how do they differ from men's programs? You know, I was looking for this online. Um, I think there's there's more coming up. I think people are getting better at realizing that HIV is a, a very complex issue and that it's good sometimes to just address it by its gender and say, let's talk about women and let's talk about its effect. And I think you're going to see more. I couldn't find um, specific programming. I mean, I know in the work I do in education, there are some real differences how you work with women than men. Um, we do a program with women in incarceration, and that's a whole other issue. How you approach women in incarceration is very different from how you approach men in incarceration. So I, I think it's really important to look at the ways women communicate, how they talk to each other, how they, um, some of the things we're talking about here today. So I think we'll get better at it, but I'm not aware of anything specific going on right now. I know the health department does have a women uh, with HIV and AIDS uh, task group working right now to address some of those issues. And nationally, there are a number of gender specific uh, programs within the black community, within the African American community. Uh, some of them are uh, out of the Bomb and Gilead and other organizations. Uh, San Diego has a very, very active uh, HIV and AIDS prevention network as well as all of California, of course. And what I'm made aware of, um, maybe not specifically to HIV, but um, gender specific to women like Clayton had already mentioned, um, they have a program where Salt Lake Valley Health Department goes in and educates incarcerated women. Um, they also have a program um, educating women who are um, commercial sex workers as well as those who are in some type of a treatment program. There, there also are some uh, studies going on. We've talked a lot about HIV, but human papillomavirus, which can lead to uh, risk of cervical cancer or penile cancer in f 10, 15 years after exposure, and herpes simplex virus. There are immunization trials going on through Dr. Woody Spruance at the Medical Center, but available here. Um, the, um, to be immunized prophylactically so that if you're exposed, it won't become a problem. And that's um, a step in the right direction because not a, some is skin-to-skin -skin contact and doesn't involve anything else other than skin touching skin. And herpes and human papillomavirus are two of those. And there's, there's got to be a better way um, to prevent these. Um, and one of the ways may be immunizations and people can participate in that, but the initial studies on both of them suggest that immunization rate was about 70% effective. Um, I know we hear a lot about campaigns against breast cancer and it's primarily the one focus that women really have um, launched a crusade against education-wise, um, but the number one killer of women is heart disease. Um, so with the exception of breast cancer, why are women's health issues given less preference. I mean, I know I see the, the commercials for Lipitor and all of these, you know, prevention medications, and all of the people in the commercials are men. Um, can you guys, maybe, perhaps we've already addressed this, but I'd like to post the question anyway. As a cardiologist, I can tell you that the initial studies done until the 1990s were all on uh, Caucasian males. And it's still a woman who comes in, the woman's presentation of heart disease is very different than a man's. Oftentimes it will be fatigue, more than the general fatigue of trying to keep up with everything that women do. 
And it's not chest pain that's radiating down the arm or jaw pain, but it's just generalized fatigue. And it's still a matter of education of healthcare providers that symptoms occur differently in different populations. And to be aware of those, we need to educate the healthcare providers that presentation is different. Um, treatment may be different because of the size of the vessels and mortality is certainly much higher in the woman than the man who presents with coronary artery disease, partially because of late detection, partially because of coronary artery size and a lot of other factors. But I think it starts not only with education of health care providers but again the patients. We have to be pr proactive in saying, no, I'm more tired than what I usually am. You can't ignore this. It's not just that we're all tired. It's not just that I'm a woman. <laughs> um, this needs to be addressed. I would second that in terms of um, educating patients in the general population. I just see in my practice, women are terrified of dying of breast cancer, even though they're, they're much more likely to die from heart disease. And there's this real misperception out there that, you know, they're going to die of breast cancer, not heart disease, which just isn't, um, the numbers don't support that. So we really need to educate um, women and the, the general public about that. Um, this is more of a general question, but what can we do to improve health care access and delivery for women? The list goes on. <laughs> I think we share some of those already. One, encourage more women to go into those health professions. It's important that we are there uh, in the room discussing, working along with our male co counterparts to make a difference and to bring those issues that are specific to women to light and to challenge the status quo. And I think it was already shared about our involvement. If we are going to be legislators, we can definitely be up there on a regular basis speaking to the issues and calling and getting our friends and neighbors to call and let them know these things are important to us. They will be accountable, but like everything else, it's the squeaky wheel that gets the most grease. And if we are trying to be nice and polite, oh, I don't want to w make waves, then we'll be overlooked. And so it's time for us to just shout as loud and as boisterous as we want to that we have some issues and you're going to sit down and listen to us or else and mean it and follow up and move across racial lines and ethnic lines and economic lines to make a difference because oftentimes uh, those who are less well off economically are often left behind. Uh, those of us, of uh, people of color are often left behind and the attention is rising when we look at the number of new AIDS cases and heart disease. We're at the top of the list in all the wrong categories. We are dying. We are dying and we need help and we can't do it alone. So it's important that we work together to keep these issues at the forefront of our own agendas, at our state's agendas, and of course at a national agenda. <laughs> Oh, yes, <laughs> All I was going to say was incorporating more standard practices, um, making it so that when somebody does go in um, and say they're sexually active, um, you're not going to test this one person for HIV, but you're going to test somebody else for something different. And also incorporating more inclusive language um, by the providers. I, yeah, I want to reinforce that. I think that men, when men get with a healthcare provider, they're more inclined to question or to ask about a second opinion. Men are just trained to do that. Our culture reinforces that's what men should do. Women are more inclined to listen to a healthcare provider and not always question because our culture still reinforces that, you know, women should be quiet and polite, that that is what women do. And I'm, I, you know, bleh, that's just silly. Um, women need to be loud and vocal um, and start saying, here's what I need and here's why I need it. Thank you very much. Um, and being able to question uh, providers and, and why they make the decisions they do. And please get politically involved. Please, before I die, I beg, I beg you, please make a woman president in this country. Please, please, please. Um, yeah. I mean, I just think women make such profoundly smart decisions. Um, and I, uh, please, before I die put a woman in the White House. <laughs> well, part of that has to do with the big cultural shift, though. Yes. I mean, we're taught from the time we're uh, sandbox age that uh, girls play together and we cooperate and boys fight. And part of that begins at that early stage. And you also have to look at the studies that suggest that it takes, from a time something's implemented in healthcare, a change, it takes 40 years before it reaches every provider. 
So if we're talking about educating providers and educating patients, it's going to be several decades from now before we're going to see the fruits of that labor. doesn't mean we shouldn't progress forward and educate our providers and our patients and ourselves and our legislatures, but it's a long road ahead of us to be able to change the nature of what we in society have come to expect. Um, next question. Is the gender of the primary care physician a factor in health care that prevents infection and spread of HIV and AIDS among the population? For example, if women are seeing male doctors, are they less likely to receive the guidance, resources, and health care they need regarding their sexuality and disease control? Or is this also a factor for female care providers? I'll start. I don't mind. <laughs> uh, there are some issues with gender. A uh, while back, probably in the late 70s, one, a student from the University of Utah, he was a health education student, uh, did a study uh, with African American families in Utah, primarily the Salt Lake City area, about that primary care physician. Surprisingly, his research showed that for blacks, they weren't as concerned about the color of that person. But a part of that conclusion was they didn't have an expectation in Utah. I'm in Utah, it'll be a white person. Most of them that live in other places have never had a Caucasian person being their primary care physician or had ever gone to one. And likewise, uh, issues around gender. For so long, we expected it to be a man. We weren't looking for a woman. We didn't even have a hope that, wow, wouldn't it be great if it was a woman? It was mainly men, so the expectation wasn't there. And as we become more educated and informed and speaking up, we seek out uh, female care providers. I know myself, I started out with a male uh, primary care for provider, and a lot of issues weren't ever discussed, ever discussed. And I didn't feel like discussing. And when we say we need to be more educated, it's important that we even help one another know what questions to ask. For a long time, I didn't know what to ask. I didn't know how to write down my needs and then go to the doctor and articulate them. So, you know, gender, I think, does matter in, uh, I guess, making us more comfortable when we walk in the room. It's just like me going and seeing a black person. It's like, okay, I don't have to deal with that. Now let's get on with the issue. And I think we have that same sense when we go in and see a woman. At least she knows some of the things I deal with. She's experienced them, so let's move on. I think that's true. I think it's just what's, you know, in your forebrain as well, you know, working with these issues clearly, you know, they come up a lot in my practice, but I do think um, men are very trainable <laughs> in the office and, you know, it's up to us to, um, you know, to do that. I think not only does uh, gender play a role, but age and socioeconomic background and language and color and ethnicity and everything that's social about us. And we can all provide providers who may look like us, but that we can't communicate with. So I think um, it, it's, yes, it plays a role because sometimes you feel like someone who looks like you gender-wise or age-wise or whatever it is, maybe you be able to uh, communicate better with. And I think everyone's educable um, to be sensitive to all of those issues so communication is better both ways. Society sends conflicting messages to women about sexuality. Women are supposed to look sexy, um, but not be sexual, or they should be, you know, the current trend is for women to be real nasty looking, or present themselves as being very nasty, but be virtuous as the behavioral expectation. So how, does the, how do these media messages translate into the spread of HIV and AIDS for women? Oh, man. <laughs> Well, because it, it's it's like the person, if, if it was a rape situation, you know, that person is no longer the victim. That woman is no longer the victim. She's the one who brought it on herself. So I think that brings on a lot when it comes to um, the, com the contribution, when it comes to the spread of HIV, when it comes to the messages that we as women are hearing out there. I think of the movie, I can't even think of the title, with Demi Moore and uh, Michael Douglas, when they get disclosure when they get before the um, 
mediator and she says, you know, you want us to wrap it and tie it and she just goes through all of these characterizations about how women supposed to be and not enjoy sex and she proclaimed that she enjoyed it and she was aggressive and everybody's like, whoa, you know, you can't do that. So I, I think it's important that we, we get involved there. There are those standards, but we have to continue to work through them. Whenever you start talking about the media, it's tough. Um, did anybody ever see, there was a couple years ago, Sherry O'Hara on Saturday Night Live did a little routine with the Barbie doll where she talked about the progress women had made and then <laughs> she'd back it up every time something came along and she was like talking about the great things women had done and then she said, oh, then Marilyn Monroe comes along. Oh, we go back. Oh, and she came up with, I forget who the last one was. Oh, uh, uh, I'm going to forget, Pamela Anderson. And the line was, Pamela Anderson made... Uh, Marilyn Monroe looked like Stephen Hawking in a dress. It was a good line. <laughs> you know, the media is a mixed bag. Um, the problem here is just like in politics, despite the fact I love sex in the city, it's still written and produced by men, um, which is fascinating to me. Why aren't there more women directors? Why aren't there more women artists? You know, I, as much as we want more women in politics, I want to see more women um, controlling the media. Uh, and especially advertising. I mean, it's still a male-dominated industry, and that, that, that's not a good balance. I think along with the media, a lot of times there are mixed messages ongoing. I have teenagers, so they like BET, and we fight about it's black entertainment television, and we all know, you know, with this whole new... Uh, genre of rap music and hip hop that most of the women on the videos are very scantily dressed everybody is partying and loving every minute of it and then in the middle of it they stop and do a condom commercial I think it kind of loses its impact in the middle of all of that you know with the boobs and the butt hanging and say yeah wrap it up it's like they miss the whole point because the other images were so profound. So I think we have to definitely challenge media about those messages and that they're clear and that they're um, all across the board, you know, that we are willing to take a stand. If we can watch tampon commercials, you know, doing dinner and at 5 o'clock, we can watch preventative messages at that same time. It's okay. I think... Um Dr. Elders, who's speaking on Wednesday, uh, was a proponent of taking this message and empowering the family and the school at a young age, grade school through high school, and empowering them to realize that some of the messages they see are inappropriate and not appropriate for their education. And I think if we take it back and empower our families and empower each of us and empower our children to realize that uh, media is not always what a really true reality is, um, it's easy to blame the media, it's easy to point it as a finger, but I think we need to educate ourselves and those around us about its effect and its reality. We all know that there are several um, forms of birth control that have been invented for women, everything from patches to implants in the arms, sticks, all kinds of things. And there's primarily just one um, form for men. So you'd think that women would um, be more comfortable or be able to find something that works for them. But typically, you know, what are women's options um, if she wants, you know, to have sex and her male partner doesn't want to use a condom because there's only just this one form? And what are the barriers that keep women from accessing um, a reliable form of birth control? Oh, education and cost. I mean, it's really unfortunate that um, contraception is so expensive and that insurance uh, policies oftentimes don't cover um, the different options. Fortunately, you know, um, we are making some progress in like looking at the patch and the vaginal ring and, you know, where women might have failures on the pill because you have to remember to do something every day. Now they just have to remember to do something once a week or once every three months with depo. So we are making some headway in the efficacy um, but still, I think major barriers are, you know, expense for a lot of women. Well, that's not only the barrier for contraception, but for any sexually transmitted disease. Without a condom, it's, uh, it's difficult to prevent. Yes. And women are ten times more likely with HIV and HPV to, um, once 
in contact with it to acquire the disease than men are. So there's a huge difference. Yeah, I mean, all the sexually transmitted infections are inherently on a physiologic basis very sexist in that, right. you know, women, time, women usually or, you know, have the potential to pay a much bigger health cost from being exposed to these um, different things. Right. And in the communities of color, that whole thing about trust and uh, not being considered loose to even talk about those kinds of things about preventing pregnancy and, and let alone prevent the spread of disease because uh, if there's a disease you have it or you're carrying it not the male and when we look at reasons why uh, more men aren't using condoms they just don't want to doesn't feel good you know takes away from uh, my machismo and they don't want to do it. And women, on the other hand, are leery to take a stand. Uh, we do some of our outreach in the prison, and we'll have commercial sex workers that are tell us even a lot of their clients don't want them to use a condom. It's like, that's silly. And they've learned how to do it in their mouths and slip it on them without them knowing it. Those kinds of things, just to try to negotiate safer sex. And it's definitely a challenge but there are more things out there and, and as a part of our harm reduction we tell women what they can do we give them products to use tell them where to get them if they need help getting those you know female condoms and things come back to us we'll help you because it's important that they protect themselves there are so many issues um, that I look at as an educator that affect barriers uh, to women correctly and consistently using birth control but the one that I'm the most passionate about again is that positive regard for sexuality you know men Viagra comes on the market a product that was designed to help men that had erectile dysfunction and yet every man wanted it you know men want anything that will help their sexual performance they're like ooh that's for sex I've got to get me some of that we're always looking for it we're on the prowl for it because we just think it's a great wonderful thing um, we have birth control available for women but our culture makes it so prohibited um, and women aren't out there celebrating and saying it's isn't it wonderful that you know there's birth control to prevent a pregnancy we have all these wonderful options because sexuality is so important to us. The fact that men always embrace sexual progress um, and women aren't accorded that same equity, that's just silly. And we all have to be talking about that and saying how silly it is and giving people an equitable view of their sexuality. The possibility of conception for a woman creates a myriad of problems that her male counterparts do not face. Women are sometimes held to an impossible standard of perfection and accountability when pregnant. They're expected to immediately quit harmful habits such as smoking or to immediately care about the well-being of a fetus above their own. If they do not, they're condemned. What does this judgment mean for women with HIV and AIDS who are pregnant and what does it mean for their potential offspring? Do women with HIV and AIDS receive lower, higher, or the same standard of care as women with HIV and AIDS who are not pregnant? Well, you know, for women who do have HIV or who are pregnant, um, there's a lot riding on getting into health care because you can definitely de decrease that transmission to the baby by 70%. So, you know, not only is the woman's health, you know, of issue, but also the health of her baby. And that can actually be a huge motivating issue for women to get into care and to really, you know, start, um, you know, healthier um healthcare practices because of the pregnancy. So it's um, you know, important to do that. As we educate women, we try to remind them to just do one thing at a time. Oftentimes they feel overwhelmed by all of these things that they're having to do for themselves and their family. So we let them know just one thing at a time, one thing at a time, and it's okay to ask for help. Um, we'd like to open it up to the audience now if, you, if anyone has questions. Kathy, go ahead.
Without so a the doubt. question, sorry, the question was, abs how does the abstinence-only policy um, going to affect women's health education and sexuality education that we've done so far? Oh, it is definitely going to take us back. <laughs> There's no question about that. Um, you know, when you look at you know abortion rates in our country compared to European countries, it's just appalling in our country that we have such a high abortion rate. And a lot of that goes back to education and availability of contraception. And those things can't be addressed if you have an abstinence-only policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's little evidence out there that abstinence-only programs are effective. Um, I think we can all understand that. Plus, it also goes back to this barrier, I think. I'm, I'm fine with abstinence. I think it's great. At the same time, don't you find it interesting that we use the terminology in our culture, when did you lose your virginity? <laughs> and when did you lose it? <laughs> you lost it. You're never getting it back. You know, it's a negative, bad, horrible thing. We never approach it like, when did you have your first meaningful sexual experience? What did that look like for you? <laughs> when did you have your next one? What did that look like for you? We don't do that because we just think that's, there's something weird about that. And of course, there's nothing weird about it at all. We're sexual beings. We're lifelong sexual beings, and it should be celebrated more openly. Um, it's interesting how we want to curtail especially teenager sexuality. We're just so damn jealous of them. Um, intimidated by them. You know, we want to curtail it. You know, don't you be having sex. You're too young, you know. It's a difficult question when someone's ready for sexual experiences. It's a developmental issue. It's very challenging. Um, and that's why parents and the conversations parents have are so important. Yeah, Jocelyn Elders is going to be here today. She's so amazing to me. I love her. One thing, don't bring up masturbation with her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that, was, that, that ended her career because she said in a speech to the NRA that masturbation was one topic that should be included in a comprehensive sexuality education package. She really said nothing out of the ordinary, but it got blown out of proportion in the media. And she lost her job. A Clinton appointee lost her job. Surgeon General, boom. But six years later, David Satcher came on the scene and wrote the call to action where he said we all needed to have more responsible conversations about sexuality, including masturbation, including anal sex, including oral sex. If you haven't read David Satcher's Call to Action, please do. Um, and we need to hold our government accountable that a Surgeon General drafted that document and that it was supported and it was released during the Bush administration. He's a former Surgeon General now, and we have a new Surgeon General, but still, <laughs> um, Satcher wasn't, didn't lose his job over that. He simply stepped down, but it wasn't over that. You didn't hear about the call to action. We all know Jocelyn Elders got released, fired, uh, axed for saying masturbation. How many of you know about David Satcher's call to action? That was an amazing document. Because he basically said, look, this abstinence stuff is lovely and it's great, but we're an industrialized country and we still have the highest rates of unintended pregnancy, spread of STIs, what the heck is going on? We got to start talking about this stuff. Right. And I think along with that, the whole issue around abstinence doesn't go far enough. I think it's, we say, don't do it. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> okay, that is not abstinence education. You have to, we're, we're the total being, let's talk about the whole self, and if I'm not going to do that, then what am I going to do? Help me, tell me, you know, and tell me about that spirituality, those other things. A lot of us just want to leave it at, say no, don't do it. That's what's not working. I think it, abstinence is more than just saying no. It's dealing with that whole person and you start very early so that we view ourselves differently. We take certain pride and accountability in who we are. <laughs> yes, definitely. More so. That is true, and that's something that is even harder to share uh, with women, that your, your mate, your <laughs> husband may not 
wow, isn't that a novel idea? Uh, we, we thought that for about the first year of marriage. <laughs> Mom, you didn't tell me this part, you know? And so I think it is important because uh, we look at the divorce rate and all of those things and what we did prior to getting married or what we did prior to that long-term relationship. And that was one of the things that drew me to be tested. Let's be real. If we're not willing to get tested ourselves, assuming that we're in, you know, I've been married 25 years, I'm okay. No, that's not true. Do it. Get tested. It's again a matter of education. And no one's safe. And everyone is vulnerable. Um, and there's not a set of circumstances that can't be altered. And so it's a matter of education. And again, it goes along with sexuality and the whole being and what is a sexual human being and what is important for us to take control of and we are responsible for ourselves and we need to be proactive about our health and proactive about being educated what's beneficial for us and it's not who we are but what we do that puts us at risk and a lot of us are still looking at the person and not the issues the environment yes more questions christy Do you want to repeat the question? The question is, do HIV symptoms present differently in women than in men? Um, there are some different uh, manifestations. Like, for instance, um, women are more pr prone to uh, cervical dysplasia, which clearly isn't going to be an issue in men. There are also some similarities within the opportunistic infections. I think, you know, the initial viral infection oftentimes is similar within um, men and women, but just the manifestations can be different. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions from the audience? Go ahead. Uh, herpes uh, and HPV, human papillomavirus. Dr. Woody Spruance and a large group of co collaborators. It's an NIH-funded study, and they're in a second phase of the trial. But um, And the HPV one is just starting. But the initial, which was a small number of people, suggested it was about 70% effective. Again, looking at the fact your partner may not wear a condom, and or it may not be you know available at the time that you're um, being a sexual human being and and we need to women are physiologically ten times more likely to come down with the disease once in contact with the virus whatever it is whatever the STD is and so we need to be responsible for our own health and one of the ways to be responsible is to prevent it from occurring ever and vaccination is uh, one of the things that Dr. Spruance and a large group of investigators are looking at. The original articles, if you want to reference, were in the New England Journal last November for both the uh, human papillomavirus and herpes simplex virus and showed a very good efficacious, uh, very good response to the vaccination. Any more questions? Go ahead. Not very much now, and, and that's the challenge. There really aren't. Our basic uh, health education curriculum is very limited, and when I talk to parents, most of them aren't telling their kids either. And so we have a whole population of people who are among the fastest growing uh, rates of those infected that are not being educated. So one of the things that it is important for us to do, wherever we are, whatever we do, by any means necessary, that we share information with young people. I share information at church. I don't do it as the church. If I'm with the young people and they ask questions, and they always do, I tell them what it is. I tell them what the Bible says about it and some other practical, scientific issues that are going on and they appreciate they grab that information and I tell them that they're responsible to tell someone else whatever groups we're involved in we need to speak about it talk about it and ask questions because many uh, on the health side they still think parents are talking about it and parents on one hand don't want the school to talk about it but on the other hand many of them think the school is telling their kids something and the bottom line is they're not getting the information or they're getting it the same way we did 
from friends who don't know much better than we did, people making up stories and telling us, and we see that kids are still getting pregnant. But it's not only the adolescents, it's their parents. Definitely. I mean, when you do uh, surveys of, of just basic human anatomy, um, even parents can't mm -hmm. answer half of the questions correctly. So it's, it's education for the public in general. Teenagers need it, parents need it, college students need it, we all need it. We all need to be educated about the issues um, and our own sexuality. And it's, uh, it, there is not the funding that is necessary in this public school systems to provide adequate education. It, and what is being prevented is quite restricted. So then it leaves you, how do you get the information to those that are sexually active um, that are at biggest risk? It's a difficult issue. I wonder if Clayton could talk for a minute about um, the scare tactics that often accompany scientific education about HIV, AIDS, STIs. We kind of say, these are all the horrible things that can happen to you and you're going to be freaked out, so we want to scare you, you know, into abstinence. And um, talk a little bit more about how the move in education now. Well, I think people still do that. Um, we still get requests all the time. I'm, at my desk, I pick up the phone and someone says, we've got some kids out here who, who are very ignorant. They'll tell me that. They don't know what they're at risk for, and you just need to come and scare them. Uh, they'll say that to me on the phone, and I usually have to say, we, you know, we, we really try to stay away from that scare thing. Um, that doesn't really help. Um, motivate people to be screened um, or to celebrate their sexuality in such a way that they would take good care of it. Um, it it's tough. I just don't think that stuff works. Um, we used to have pictures in our kits of the different STIs and it took me four years to get the educators that I work with to stop using them um, because they felt that it was still important to show it and I said why most infections you can't see it anyway why why do you think showing it helps people to identify and the pictures are always people who have it in the last degree and oh, you know and until people approach it with less fear and that it's not so fearful to be screened and you know your question about people in committed relationships that was really good that got me thinking I'm like wow you know it's so hard I mean people get in a committed relationship they breathe a huge sigh of relief like you know I don't have to worry about some of this stuff anymore um, and you know your point is well taken we do but can you imagine trying to go out and do that little education presentation hey <laughs> You're all married, but you're still gonna get something. You know, it's, it would just be so hard. Be like, no, I trust my partner, um, which is good. You know, you want to have trust, but clearly, you know, it, it's still an issue. But I think if we liked our sexuality more and we could talk about it easier, those things would be less fearful. People would talk more openly in their relationships about the feelings they still have um, when they see someone else they're attracted to and, and what that feels like for them. And, you know, just being more open in general would be so, would be so positive to me. <laughs> Very good. But the, the scare tactics, um, some of the human papillomavirus infection, 80% of them are asymptomatic. So if you're going to use scare tactics, it's not till 15 years later when they have cancer and they're being treated for their cancer and they should have been tested a long time ago. So it's not the most effective method of education. And most young people feel that they're invincible. Bring it on. I can take it. It won't bother me. Right. Yeah. Yes. Sexuality is a very big topic. <laughs> Lots of areas. The other thing too, I just want to say, um, the invincibility of kids. You know, we really don't want to take that away from them. You know, I mean, that's part of being young is believing that you're invincible. I don't want to take that away from a young person. Would I consider myself successful when a young person finally concedes, you're right, I can die, I can get an infection. <laughs> I can make stupid decisions. I mean, it's like, good Lord, we all learn that as we grow old, um, and it's so scary. I want young people to celebrate being young, too. I don't want to take that away from them. More questions? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Shut them down. Oh, well. <laughs> Thank you.
we're all going to go out and make a difference. There was a slogan, each one reach one, and, and that's what it's going to take for us to address these issues when it was, uh, was it take a daughter or a friend to the doctor day or something? I think we need to do that more regularly and take our husbands to the doctor. Yes. Student Health would love to be involved. We'd love to. Tricia and myself, I can't speak for the other group, but we'd love to. Residents all, yeah. We'd and at to. Weber, we do do uh, HIV and AIDS prevention and other STIs with their incoming uh, students on a regular basis. So that's been good that they've invited us in to participate on that level. Mm -hmm. Would any of the panelists like to make a closing remark before we close? Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I just want to say, you know, I appreciate those of you who came and, and listened to us, and I appreciate the panelists for their expertise that I, I have very little expertise. Um, and that I also want to say loudly and passionately, I am a feminist. I identify as a feminist. I don't think being a feminist is a bad thing. Um, I think I'm a bigot almost in that I believe in women, well, really quite strongly. I think they just inherently make good decisions, and I can prove it. The Donner Party, you all remember the Donner Party? They took a shortcut and they kind of got trapped in the high Sierras and then they ran out of food so they had to eat each other except for the Reed family who never ate anyone, or so they said. Okay, of the men, women, and children in the Donner Party, who had the best survival rate? Children. Mm -hmm. Men had the worst survival rate, um, and women um, were real, real close to the children in terms of their survival rate. Now, what's really interesting about that, they looked back and tried to figure out why. Well, the men were really stressed because they were the ones who had made the decision to take the shortcut in the first place. So they had trapped their families essentially in the high Sierras without food and the stress of all of that weighed on them very heavily because there really wasn't a lot they could do. Um, the women felt like they were caretakers. Here's where being a caretaker paid off and I, I think women are ahead in terms of health because they do pay attention to their body. They do. Men are very stupid. They won't use sunscreen even though we're at risk for skin cancer. We won't use sunscreen because it's a girl thing. We're just stupid. We die of heart attacks and stress at higher rates because we won't talk. There's actually a pathology for this. Men who can't communicate their emotions. Good Lord, you wonder why I believe in women? <laughs> um, I think you're already miles ahead. And I appreciate all of that. And I appreciate your leadership. And I will follow. Anyone else? I would just like to say that uh, as women, we are more powerful than we give ourselves credit for. Uh, we pretty much run what's going on in our homes, in our communities. When I look uh, Sunday morning in my church, the majority of the people there are women, but we continue to yield that power. And we know that uh, they can't have it if we don't give it to them. So we need to use the power and the influence that we have to make a difference in these issues. We'd like to thank our panelists for being here today for this Women's Week panel. Thank and thanks to all of you for attending.